Colleagues and friends, first of all, I want to truly commend Indonesia to the latest PISA results. These last years have been really tough for young people. The pandemic has disrupted their lives and their education. Economic uncertainty has affected their families. Social media and artificial intelligence have created, yes, new opportunities, but also lots of new challenges for them. And against that backdrop, Indonesian students broadly held their ground in the quality of learning outcomes in their PISA scores. Yes, the results saw a very small dip since 2018, but that wasn't statistically significant and certainly much, much smaller than the decline in learning outcomes that we have seen in other countries across the world during the pandemic. So my congratulations for maintaining the quality of learning outcomes. And it's really important for countries to take stock of their education stance, but even more so to understand where students, schools and nations succeeded in those challenging times and what we can learn from that to help students learn better, teachers teach better and schools to operate more effectively. Now. And that's exactly you know, what PISA is about, from Argentina to Denmark, from Ukraine to the Palestinian Authority. PISA provides the most reliable global metric on what students know and what they can do in subjects that matter for their success. All in all, nearly 700,000 students from 81 countries and economies took part in this latest PISA test. And that makes it the largest international comparisons of education progress ever. But it's not just about academic success. You know, what is equally important in these latest results is that Indonesian students showed a strong sense of belonging at school, something that is so important in the times in which we live. 87% of students said they also make friends easily, compared with 76% on average across OECD countries. And similarly, while across countries students were less satisfied with their lives in 22 than in 2018, that was not true in Indonesia. And only 4% of Indonesian students said that they did not feel safe in school. Across the OECD countries, that number was twice as big. Perhaps these are the first fruits of Indonesia's drive towards merdeka or emancipated learning, where school becomes a more joyful experience, where students are empowered with agency, where they feel that sense of belonging that students in Indonesia now demonstrate in PISA. We also see that performance variability among schools is actually comparatively small in Indonesia. And if that trend continues, you know, one day the closest school in Indonesia will become the best school and school choice is no longer such a crucial issue. I also should commend Indonesian teachers. Students in Indonesia reported one of the highest levels of support from their teachers during the pandemic. Again, that is so important. Technology will never be a substitute for the attention and care of a teacher, since learning is not a transactional business, but always a social, a relational experience. And again, I know how much importance the Merdeka reforms place on exactly that. In PISA, the availability of teachers to help students in need had the strongest relationship to mathematics performance. Mathematics scores were 15 points higher on average in places where students agreed they had good access to teacher help, as was the case in Indonesia. These students were also more confident than their peers to learn autonomously and remotely, which is again so important today. I also want to commend Indonesian parents. In most countries, we've seen a decline in parental engagement in school over recent years, which is a real problem because parents are such an important asset for quality learning experiences. In contrast, in Indonesia, parental engagement has improved over the last years. And it's interesting that there were both more parents initiating the conversation about their children with school, but also more teachers starting that dialogue with parents. Parental engagement is so important. PISA shows that students who were supported at home had much more positive attitudes towards school and towards learning. 
overall education systems with positive trends in parental engagement in student learning between 2018 and 22 also showed greater stability or improvement in their mathematics performance. And that was particularly true for disadvantaged students. You know, in many countries, we have seen a negative trend towards commodifying education recently. Students became some kind of passive consumers of prefabricated content. Teachers became some kind of service providers and parents became clients. And that has taken out the heart of a good education, which is all it's always about creating a kind of whole of society experience now. And actually, Indonesia provides a really good example of a country that has been able to reverse that trend, to bring communities together to build excellent, excellent education. We also ask students, you know, how confident they are they could cope with another pandemic. And the share of students who said they were confident that they could use, you know, digital learning platforms was actually smaller in Indonesia than across OECD countries. Maybe technology is not yet so readily available. But interestingly, the share of students who said they could motivate themselves to learn independently, that was much higher in Indonesia than on average across OECD countries. And that self-directed learning is so critically important for learners in their future. And once again, that could be the fruit of the emphasis or of the Merdeka reforms. Well, of course, you know, there remains much room for improvement as well in the results. And I believe that the Merdeka reforms put Indonesia on a promising track for further improvement. So what can PISA tell us here? Well, you know, for a start, PISA challenges the notion that higher investment in education automatically yields better outcomes. Yes, you know, there is a positive relationship between investment in education and average performance up to a threshold of about $75,000 in spending per student, you know, up to the age of 15. And there is a clear case for Indonesia to invest more in education as the country, you know, falls well below that kind of threshold. No. But the data also show that, you know, beyond that threshold, and one day Indonesia will reach it, extra spending makes much less of a difference. And what often matters more is how resources are used. Countries committed to establishing top tier education systems tend to prioritize the quality of teaching over the size of a class. They also provide you know, funding mechanisms that align resources with needs, with special attention to the students who need it most. They also invest wisely in school infrastructure, including digital resources. PISA also shows that students have generally embraced learning through digital technologies. Now, most Indonesian students feel quite confident of using various technologies, including learning management systems, school learning platforms, video communication programs, and all of that matters. Now, across OECD countries, and even after, when you account for a social background, students who spend up to one hour per day learning on digital devices in school scored 14 points higher in mathematics than students who didn't do that. At the same time, you know, technology used for leisure rather than instruction, you know, such as mobile phones in schools, that is clearly linked to poorer results. Now, students who said they become distracted by other students who are using digital devices scored 15 points lower than students who reported that never happens. Now, and even after accounting for social background. How education systems grapple with, you know, technological change is a defining feature of the new educational landscape. So lots of things to be proud of in Indonesia with these latest PISA results, but also some challenges. It's important to continue to reimagine education, to make our students leaders for a better future, to help our teachers become great coaches, great mentors, and creative designers of truly innovative learning environments, and to build communities that do not conserve but truly transform education. And that's not about making the impossible possible, but about making the possible attainable.